Hey, good morning, Christ Church. It is week 13, day one, and we are still in First Thessalonians. I'm here with Jonathan and Matt, and we are really looking forward to moving through a few passages with you this morning. And so we talked about First Thessalonians a little bit yesterday, but this is likely the first letter Paul wrote. Um, he had to abruptly kind of leave this church plant, and we see that in Acts 17. And so now he's writing back to the church, and he's going to tell us a little bit in the passages we look at today, kind of recapping um, how they got Timothy out there to get a report, how the report came back to Paul that the church, even though they were suffering and being persecuted, that they're actually doing really well. They have joy from the Holy Spirit, that they're sticking with their faith. And so Paul, being the great pastor that he is, is going to continue encouraging them. And so we're going to see in our passages today, we're going to see a quick kind of recap of, of what led Paul to write to the Thessalonians. Um, and then we're going to see Paul begin to encourage them to live lives worthy of the gospel. And then at the end of our passage, Paul's gonna address a few questions they have about those who had died, um, maybe even likely those who have been martyred for their faith and what that means. And so we're looking forward to today's passage. Um, before we dive in, uh, Jonathan, you mind opening this up? Yeah, I'd love to. Father, thank you uh, for the encouragement that you give us, the encouragement of, of your word. Uh, the encouragement of the lives that we see of uh, lives changed by you, God. Thank you for uh, speaking to us. Thank you for allowing us to hear your word. Thank you for uh, communicating to us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, church, we'll begin in chapter 2, verse 17, and read all the way through the end of chapter 4. Chapter 2, 17. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you and our glory you are our glory and joy. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who was our brother and co-worker in God's service, in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen you and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For we knew quite well that we were, de that, that we were destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. But Timothy had just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live, since you, are, since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return and for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may the God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts that you will be blameless and be holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. And in fact, you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do more and do more, to do this more and more. For you know the instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like pagans who do not know God. And that is the matter no one should, and in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins. As we told you and warned you before, 
For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write, for, write to you, for you, are, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life, so that your daily life may win the respect of others, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who have slept in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring those, bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with a voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And so again, we get to see the, the wonderful heart of Paul to this church. Um, he, he celebrates their continued faith. He addresses a few issues going on um, within the congregation, and then he answers the question about those who have fallen asleep and says one day Jesus will return and we will get to be with him forever. So we have a great hope. Um, and so guys, as we're looking at this passage, where do you guys want to start? I mean, we can start back towards um, chapter 3. I, I think one of the things that always stands out to me is Paul says, man, we longed to come to you, but Satan's blocked our way. And then towards mm -hmm. the end he says, you know, now may... Our God and Father himself and the Lord Jesus Christ clear the way for us to come to you. That, that Paul lived with this recognition of the sovereignty of God over all things. You know, whether that's his coming and going, you know, whether that's his imprisonments or sufferings. Like he was so deeply aware that, that God was sovereign over all things. Yeah. And, and that's an anchor, I think, for us yeah. you know, as believers today. The sovereignty of God is, is, a, is an anchor. I think it was Spurgeon that said it's the pillow upon which a Christian can sleep, you know, rest their head, that mm -hmm. our God is sovereign over all things. You know, he's in control and we can rest in that. And that Absolutely. seems to be what's helping him through the persecution, right? Yeah. Not only is he talking about God's sovereignty and them getting there and not getting there, but knowing, okay, I'm going through persecution, I'm going through suffering, and that still had to have been an anchor keeping him settled in God during those difficult times. And how timely is it for us in this time, weird time period of 2020 of just with the pandemic and with protests and rioting and whatever's going on, knowing that God is in control, that he's sovereign, that, that he's that pillow, that security. Mm -hmm. I love, uh, you can kind of sense Paul's relief uh, of hearing of the mm -hmm. Thessalonians' faith and love for each other because he didn't know how it was going. We didn't have the internet or, you know, he had to have hand, things hand delivered. Didn't even have a national post office, I guess, or an international post office. USPS? It, it might be. <laughs> but he's so relieved about it. And, that, and that's, yeah. it's kind of sprinkled throughout the love that, that Paul sees and his prayer for them is that they would have love for each other, not just a little bit of love, but love that would be overflowing, like bubbling over. And uh, that's so fantastic because when we think about personal morality and it, and here it mentions sexual morality. Mm -hmm. The reason that we're, we should not be sexually immoral, at least one of the reasons, is that it really, it hurts, it's unloving towards our brothers and sisters. And when sexual immorality enters our life, we're really uh, objectifying and uh, reducing the, the, I guess, the dignity of each human being that God has created us, and we as his children. Oh, absolutely. And even to what you were mentioning at the start, um, you know, I, over this last 13 weeks or so, I have felt myself identifying more with what Paul's talking about there, just kind of that, I hope the church is doing okay. You know, because Paul, yeah. in this moment, he had, he had a, a big distance from these people. And we've been distanced more than we're used to over the last 
several months now, my goodness. And, and one of the things that's been kind of cool, and you may not know we've been doing this church, but every Saturday, I've been getting on a Zoom call with all of our group shepherds. Um, we've done it nearly every week since this has started. And, and I've felt that same kind of tension as it like, okay, it's Friday night, Saturday morning, we're getting together with the shepherds, like, and I hope they're doing okay. I, I, you know, kind of bracing for the worst, like hoping for the best. And so I, and then Paul gets relieved, right? He hears they're doing okay. And, and I've had the experience that similar relief week after week, hearing that our shepherds reporting, like, our people are doing okay. Yeah. And they're doing well, even in the midst of a difficult time. And so, man, praise God, because God's the one doing that, right? He's mm -hmm. the one holding yeah. us together. Yeah, he says in chapter 313, may the God, you know, our God, strengthen your hearts, mm -hmm. you know, so that you'll be blameless. Like, Paul, Paul was deeply aware that it was God who was at work in us. I mean, he wrote this, we saw it in Ephesians, um, you see it in Philippians, you know, that it is God who is at work in us, you know, carrying us to completion. And here he is, may God strengthen our hearts so that you'll be blameless and holy in the presence and, you know, the presence of our God and Father. And I love kind of, we, we often wonder, what is God's will for my life? And there's a lot of different directions we could go mm -hmm. with that. But I mean, one of the things Paul states plainly is that we would be sanctified. It is God's will that you should mm -hmm. be sanctified. And, you know, he goes on to talk about, you know, our sexual conduct. But even more so, um, you know, towards the end, he says, For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life that, that holiness encompasses, you know, all of life mm -hmm. as those who are in Christ, because Christ is holy. And that's the call, right? That we would be strengthened by God, who is making us holy, to live holy lives. Um, and and so there, I think there's one sense as I read this, I'm thinking, man, w what a tall task. I mean, that's yeah. impossible. And yet it's not as impossible as I think it is because God's at work in me, you know, making me holy. Mm -hmm. And that's Paul's prayer, right? And so again, like he, he, he's at a distance. He can't meet with the church as he wants to meet with them. And so what's he do? Like, well, I'll just wait till we... He's just praying for them. Yeah. Like even from a distance church, like we can still be praying for each other. And then when we talk about, okay, like I want to pray, what's the content of my prayer? I mean, he gives you a great model here. You know, right. in chapter one, he kind of had a prayer of thanksgiving, just thanking God. And then here, this is oftentimes called the prayer of endurance, you know, that the people would continue to endure. And so yeah, if you want to think of a couple of things to pray for one another, for Christ Church, for other churches in our city, man, that, that God and His Father May the Lord increase your love and it cause it to overflow and may he strengthen your hearts. Um, two great things to consider praying. That love would overflow and our hearts would be strengthened. Yeah. I love verse 13 um, where, I mean, there's so much compassion that Paul has. These Thessalonians are concerned. Their loved ones who are in Christ are dying. And they're like, hey, we understand the resurrection, but how does it exactly work? Mm -hmm. When I was younger, I used to read this and go, oh, cool, we're going to find out kind of the order of things. Yeah. But now if we, you actually lose people that you love, it, it, it's so comforting to know that, I mean, Psalm 116 says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And it just kind of shows that God is really compassionate towards us and he understands our loss and he feels it and he sees it. Enough to tell us, like, rest assured that those who've died in Christ, they're going to be raised before you who have been left behind. Yeah. And so don't worry about them. Yeah. They're even going to be ushered into the kingdom before you. Yeah, they're not going to miss out. It's the same yeah. issue that the Corinthian church was facing, you know, that those who, and I love, you know, who sleep in death, you know, the, the Corinthian church is wondering what's going to happen to these brothers and sisters who have gone before us. They're missing out, mm -hmm. you know, and, and same thing's happening in Thessalonica. And Paul's saying, no, they're not going to miss out on anything. Yeah. Those who sleep in death, you know, and I, I love what he says next, for we believe that you know Jesus died and rose again so that we may believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And he says, so then we grieve, absolutely, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope. As yeah. Christians, our right. hope rests in the death and the resurrection, you know, in the ascension. And now, once again, Jesus will come. Like, our hope rests there. And so, yes, grieve the death of, of loved ones, but we grieve with hope that we'll see them again. They're not missing out. We're not missing out. Mm -hmm you know, Christ cares for, yeah. for his own. Yeah. It's huge comfort. Yeah. And now we get to see them with Jesus. You know, it's yeah. not just like, oh, I get to see grandma. Uh, or, but, and it is that, uh, maybe to some degree, but it's, it's Jesus, right? That mm -hmm. he is central to all of this. Yeah. And even some commentators would say that Paul might be kind of piggybacking on something that Caesar would do, that often if a delegation went out and they were coming back mm -hmm. um, with all the troops and all the people, that the people would go to them. Mm -hmm. and they go to their king and obviously we've already seen that 
a lot of the persecution coming to the Thessalonians is because they've left Caesar as king and made Jesus as king. Mm -hmm. So kind of a beautiful picture of, of Paul knowing that and taking that and saying, look, just like you have that visual of us going out to Caesar, that king, one day it's going to be even better that we are going to go and be united with mm -hmm. our real king, which is Jesus. And so what a, a, a hope that even though they're suffering, they, they have Christ and God's able to strengthen their hearts. And even if their suffering leads to death, they're going to still get to be with Christ. And so we see that the gospel sustains us through everything. And that's a huge part of the Christian life. And so, guys, as we wrap up this morning, let's go to the Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the words of Paul. We thank you so much for the scriptures. Forgive us for the times when we are nonchalant with them or we just dismiss them, but may we see them for what they truly are. It's your living and active word. And so, Father, we need your word. We need you to strengthen our hearts and to help us overflow with love for one another. Um, and we even need your comfort in the difficult days. Um, we have several people actually at our church who have lost loved ones over the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. And so we, we do not grieve as those without hope, um, but we do grieve with a great hope, and that hope is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so may that be true now. Um, may we experience the hope of Christ this morning. Um, may we remember um, that we are taken care of from beginning to end in Jesus, and that one day we will be with him forever. And so may we yearn for that day more and more. Praise all in Jesus' name.